Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God the Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The words of Scripture for us to consider today, this Reformation Day, are found in Galatians chapter 5, beginning at the first verse. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not allow anyone to put the yoke of slavery on you again. Look, I, Paul, tell you that if you allow yourselves to be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. I testify again to every man who allows himself to be circumcised that he is obligated to do the whole law. You who are trying to be declared righteous by the law are completely separated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. Indeed, through the Spirit, we by faith are eagerly waiting for the sure hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matters. Rather, it is faith working through love that matters. This is the word of our Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in, in Christ Jesus, as we began worship today, I reminded you that today is Reformation Day. You could consider it in part one of the days that could be the birthday of the Lutheran Church. Uh, another day, another nickname we could give Reformation might be Independence Day, because to some degree, like our verse of the day, the Son of Man sets you free, Reformation Day is all about freedom. But let's be sure that we distinguish and explain what kind of freedom we are talking about. It's not the freedom that we proclaim in the land of democracy as much as we treasure that and use those patriotic quotes like from Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. Or it's not the the freedom described by President Franklin Roosevelt who said, we and all others who believe in freedom as deeply as we do would rather die on our feet than live on our knees. That's one level of freedom. And as much as we cherish that blessing of freedom in this land, this United States, national freedom, national liberty, as it were, ultimately falls short. What do I mean by that? Let me illustrate with, with something from, from a movie. It was a number of years back, more than 20 years ago, there was a movie, Braveheart, in which uh, it depicted Scotland's fight to get out from under the oppression of the King of England. William Wallace led that fight for independence, but he was captured and condemned to be tortured and then killed. But he refused to submit to the king and beg for mercy, even if begging for mercy meant the end to the excruciating torture. In that climactic scene at the end of the movie, as he was suffering severe torture, and even the crowd who was in opposition to him started to beg for mercy from the executioner. And the magistrate leans over him one more time and gives him one last chance to beg for mercy and end the pain. And you see Wallace, lips quivering and gut-wrenching, about to speak, and he exclaims, Freedom! And the axe falls. Touching as the scene is, and that was a portrayal of a man with a brave heart, it has a depressing end. As I watched it, uh, he's good, as much good as this man may have brought to Scotland. Wallace was not free in the end. He was just plain dead, wasn't he? So we, we who cherish freedom in this land can mistakenly overvalue national freedom, right? 
Perhaps it's a struggle to find, in the struggle to find and fight for earthly freedom, which is a good and noble cause, but it goes too far if it begins to distract us from the God-given freedom from sin, death, and the devil. You see, we do not worship freedom as our God, and our government is not our God, even if they provide us uh, at, with a defense of our liberties. I would submit that our Old Testament lesson, King Nebuchadnezzar telling Daniel he had to pray only to the king, was very similar to a tendency or thought that can occur in our day to day that our government can be the answer to every single one of our requests and prayers. And government replaces God. Another danger is a little bit different. It's thinking that freedom can actually mean, oh, I'm free to do anything that I want to do. Or freedom. Freedom, a lie that the devil brings and uses to attack freedom, and one of the most basic ones is to tell us that we can gain freedom on our own. And that's the whole heartbed of the Lutheran Reformation that proclaims to us we cannot obtain spiritual freedom from God on our own. So if you want God's spiritual freedom, in Martin Luther's day, people were told, you must earn it. So we turn to the words from Galatians today to see freedom in the true and proper sense. Freedom, Christian freedom by grace through faith in Christ. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Like you, the original recipients of this letter had a clear and firm understanding at one time of salvation through faith in Christ alone. These hearers of this letter from Paul had heard Paul explain it that clearly to them, that the believer has been justified by grace, meaning that God declares sinners holy and sinless, and that's a free gift from God, unearned or deserved. That the Savior has fulfilled the law perfectly in place of us. And then he died that innocent death to pay for each and every one of our sins. And that his resurrection, coming back from the dead, is all the proof that we need, all the proof that is possibly needed to know that this gift of God belongs to you and to me. They heard this and they understood it, that Christ's gift to them, Christ has set us free through faith, believing what Christ did for us. But these Galatian Christians, they were challenged by false teachers who were attempting to convince them that they needed more than mere faith in Christ. In addition to their faith in Christ, they, they were told that they must still follow some of the uh, uniquely Old Testament ceremonies and laws, which included worship festivals, social customs, dress, and diet. In effect, these false teachers were robbing them of their freedom in Christ, a, a lot like Jesus warned about, right, sending you out like sheep among wolves. These false teachers were the wolves leading God's sheep away. And so to these people, tempted to lose sight of the truth that Christ Jesus had come by obeying the law in our place, that he fulfilled all those Old Testament laws, that's the context in which Paul writes, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not allow anyone to put the yoke of slavery on you again. Stand firm in the freedom won by Christ through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection. It's a freedom from the need to earn God's 
favor. Not only a freedom from the need to earn God's favor, a freedom from any attempt to earn God's favor. And that's quite a freedom because there's no way to earn God's freedom. No way to earn God's favor on our own. Because attempting to do it on our own, thinking we are required to do it without Christ, or even with a little bit of help from Christ, or a lot of help from Christ, will always leave us asking the question, have I done enough? Have I obeyed God fully enough with all of my heart? We can answer that question with no, we have not, which is why we confess our sins. But in spite of the fact that we confess our sins before God, Christ Jesus did it for us. These Old Testament ceremonies pointed ahead to the truth that Christ Jesus accomplished all of that in our place. But tragically, many of these first hearers of Paul's letter, these Galatian Christians, had believed the false teachers. They, they had fallen prey to the wolves, as it were. Because the wolves were insistent that they were insisting that they return to the law. And it was far more significant than a, a, few, uh, a few Old Testament things that we're picking up here and there. They were actually nullifying the work of Christ Jesus when they said, we must do something, at least a little bit of something, in order to get to heaven. In effect, they were saying Christ's death and resurrection were not enough. Any insistence on an Old Testament rite of circumcision, which is what the main thing that Paul mentions here in this section of Scripture, any insistence on that rite would wind up binding the people to obey the whole law which they could not do. Which is why Paul explains in verses 2 and 3, Look, I... Paul, tell you that if you allow yourselves to be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. I testify again to every man who allows himself to be circumcised that he is obligated to do the whole law. You who are trying to be declared righteous by the law are completely separated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. You want to earn God's favor, even in part, then you give up every bit of the gift Christ gives. Martin Luther lived at a time when the visible church of his day had fallen prey to the same doctrine of wolves, the same type of false teachers that the Galatians had. They weren't de dealing with circumcision, but they were dealing with the... the uh, the need, they thought, to confess each and every one of their sins and then make atonement specifically their own satisfaction for their sinful deeds, for each and every one. That good deeds had to complete what faith would begin, the wolf said. That extra merit with God can be earned by special prayers to the saints, or entering a monastery, or even self-inflicting yourself with pain, according to the false teachers. But blessed be to God, but that blessed be God that Martin Luther was a sheep that the Lord protected from amongst these wolves. The Lord protected this sheep, Martin Luther, by letting him dig into the Word of God, where he realized that he could not earn heaven by his own works, but Christ had. And it was a foreign righteousness, not of Martin Luther's own making, that made Martin Luther righteous or holy. It was the gracious gift from Christ Jesus. Still with us today, Still with us today are thoughts of earning something from God or making God happy with us or pleased with me because of something that I accomplished, right? And such a thing may distract me 
from true freedom in Christ. Christ Jesus gives his righteousness freely, totally by grace. And so Luther's message, the Apostle Paul's message, God's message in Scripture remains the same. Saved by grace alone, through faith alone. And that frees us from the law, slavery to the law today. I mentioned a comment earlier about another problem is thinking that freedom means I am free to do anything that I want. Paul actually addresses that in the last paragraph of this text, that spiritual freedom winds up leading us to hope. Indeed, through the Spirit, we by faith are eagerly waiting for the sure hope of righteousness. That means God's favor. And God's gift of righteousness are yours. They're, they're treasures that you have through faith in Christ. By believing God's promises about what Jesus did for you. That he did it for you and it applies to you. And this hope, this hope um, through faith is described well in Martin Luther's explanation to the uh, third article of the Apostles' Creed. We'll confess that in just a moment as it expresses the Holy Spirit's work and summarizes it. I believe that I cannot, by my own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the Gospel, enlightened me with His gifts, and sanctified and kept me in the true faith. That's the hope that we have in the Holy Spirit's work. And hope leads us to use the freedom that we have for joyful service. That's what verse 6 says. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matters. Rather, it is faith working through love that matters. Specifically, these Galatian Christians were free to use circumcision, practice circumcision, or not to be circumcised because neither action or inaction there made them worthy of God. Neither one of those actions changed their relationship with Christ Jesus. It was simply a matter of personal choice. Neither salvation nor the relationship with God depended on that right or any right from the Old Testament. It is, as Paul says, it is faith working through love that matters. Faith working through love could be another theme of the Reformation. Maybe a sub-theme underneath the freedom that we have. That salvation is only through faith. Faith in that perfect life, innocent death, and resurrection of God's Son, our only Savior. And did you catch me repeating that again? You've heard it a few times today already, haven't you? Because it is true and it is the heartbed of faith that we return to. And that through faith in Christ, all believers are righteous before God. But when Paul writes faith working through love, Paul agreed with the rest of Scripture as well, like the writings of, of St. James, who says faith without deeds is dead. Faith alone saves, but saving faith is never alone. That out of appreciation for God's gift in Christ, that hope that we have in Christ Jesus, Christians want to show that love for God. And love to their neighbors as well, whenever and wherever they can as a way of, of saving, saying thank you. Martin Luther will look to him again uh, and his life history. He, he used writing as one of the ways that he said thank you to God for that hope of righteousness. In the year 1529, he wrote the small catechism. And it's one of the many things that he wrote as a way to serve the Lord and express his thanks for free salvation. Because he had gone to visit a number of churches and realized that the very basics of the Christian faith were not well known. So, that's what Luther did. He wrote this book. And, and it's an example of 
Christians showing their love to God and love to their neighbor and showing that love in a way that reveals Christ Jesus. Martin Luther used that small catechism to describe the six chief parts, uh, summarized scripture in those six chief parts, Holy Communion. He talked about the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, Baptism, Holy Communion, and then also uh, Confession and Absolution. And these gifts of God, these truths are what he underlined in a way that the head of the household could use it to teach all the members of his family. And it's still valuable for use 491 years later. How does your faith express itself? This freedom that you have in the hope of Christ Jesus? I don't expect any of you to write a catechism. You, you're, get off on that. You don't, you don't have to write a catechism. But you are free to show what you believe in many different ways. And I trust that you do. Today, let me encourage you as part of your your thanks living, your thanks to God for the freedom you have to use Martin Luther's small catechism and keep it and the truths you find there front and center in your home. Let it be known in, by your family and in your home because it's simple explanations of the Bible truths. You know, it's something that we have in the Lutheran church. It, no stranger to the Lutheran church is that catechism, right? As the youth are trained in it for two to four years or more, and it's well worth it. We can hold on to those truths throughout life. We are free in Christ. But don't think and don't imagine that you are free in Christ so that you can be free not to use God's word. Don't think that you should be free from reviewing God's truths by avoiding the catechism. No. Go back to those teachings and the heart of the message and the Word of God regularly, daily, even twice a day, to, or more, to delve into that truth and hold on to that message of salvation by grace alone. We shout freedom in many ways, and it, maybe it's not as dramatic as William Wallace shouted uh, freedom in, in, in the portrayal of him in Braveheart. But let us shout freedom by how we use our Bible and how we use the helps that summarize the biblical teachings and assist us in explaining it, found in things like the small catechism. Let's not forget that family altar. So God's word is present in our homes, not just in church. So things like TV and athletics and the other things, even politics and the like, things that can be beneficial in their place, never overcome the importance of Christian freedom in our lives. Dear friends, stand on this freedom from sin, from death, and the devil, a freedom for service to God that gives you that hope of righteousness, a hope that we hold on to by grace through faith in Scripture. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.